Good morning, my name is Lynn Griffith. I'm a tropical plant and soil expert. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about how to properly take soil samples from container nursery stock. We'll start with the tools first. I like to use these uh, nickel or chrome plated probes. They're generally about 18 inches long. Um, two good manufacturers are JBK and um, Oakfield Apparatus. They're good strong probes that will last you a good long time. They run about $60 but they're very useful in sampling nursery stock. They're also good for checking compaction in turf samples, and they're also excellent for checking moisture levels in landscapes. The bucket you use to collect your subsamples should be a plastic bucket, a clean plastic bucket that has never had fertilizer in it. If it's ever had fertilizer in it, do not use it. Your samples will be contaminated. Don't ever use a metal bucket, not a galvanized bucket or any kind of metallic bucket because that will also contaminate your samples. Now, when you have a block of plants, typically such as this, you generally don't want to sample from the edges of the block because those areas dry out quicker and they're um, you know, less representative. The key word in taking soil samples is representative. What you collect and have in that bag should adequately as possible and accurately as possible represent the block of plants that you're sampling. What we're going to do is start, and I, I normally like to work in sort of a diagonal pattern or an X pattern through the block. If there's a special area, maybe a low spot or just an area where something's different, you probably want to avoid that. You want to insert your soil probe all the way from top to bottom in the media. And I'll start by sampling the first uh, subsoil here. You insert the probe all the way into the soil from top to bottom, and you give your wrist a little figure eight twist like this so that when you take the soil probe out, you have a nice uniform column of soil in the instrument. And you tap that into your bucket two or three times. If you just take your soil probe and stick it in the soil and pull it out without the wrist action, you don't get any soil, okay? You need that little wrist action as you go. I'm gonna kick this out because it's not representative. You normally wanna take between six and 10 subsamples per sample because pots vary a little bit, soil varies a little bit, conditions vary. So if you get six to 10 subsamples, you'll have a better chance of having a good accurate representation that the soil you have in your sample bag represents the crop in question. And we'll just move on down the row here. If you see visible fertilizer on the soil surface from a top dress, try to avoid that and just kind of sample around it. Usually that's not too hard to do. Sometimes you may need to scrape away a little bit, but uh, most of the time that's fine. Again, a couple of figure eights. Tap the media into the uh, bucket. Again, I'm avoiding row patterns. The reason for that is that when people are coming through and top dressing a block of plants, sometimes a person might be a little heavier handed than the next person. So by avoiding row patterns, you avoid that variable. So after at least half a dozen subsamples, all of which are tapped into your bucket. You need to take the media in your bucket and shake it around real good to homogenize it. I usually just go like this with some wrist action. Sometimes you can take it and just kind of go like this a little bit to mix it up good. And then you take your soil sample bag. You kind of need three hands to do this job. But um, take a soil sample bag like this. You can use Ziplocs or whatever kind of bags you like. Paper bags and wet soil don't get along too good. They tend to break once they get shipped. Try to label your bag on the outside with a magic marker or something. Don't stick a little piece of paper with the sample ID inside the bag. By the time it gets to the lab, it's usually not legible. And most laboratories need about a coffee cup of soil or so to run the test. So collect this and uh, close the bag up like this and then label it with whatever sample ID you want. The sample IDs are important to the nursery. They're not important at all to the lab, so whatever you want to put on there for ID is fine. And that's basically how you collect a soil sample. I'm going to move forward now and we're going to talk about how to sample leaf tissue. And I'm going to use this crop in front of me here because it's a little more representative and illustrative of how you want to take a leaf sample. The nutrient contents in leaf tissue vary a lot with age, a lot, very significantly. So what you normally want to sample when sampling ornamental plants is the most recent fully matured leaf on the plant. If you sample a very immature leaf like this, 
This leaf is still in the formative stages. It really hasn't stabilized in terms of its nutrient content. If you take a really old leaf like, like this, that might have even come from propagation. That leaf might be six months old. We don't care so much about the nutrient content six months ago. We care about now and going forward. So what you want to collect is the most recent fully matured leaves from the plants. Again, with a similar sampling pattern where you avoid edges and you avoid row patterns. And I would be collecting a leaf about like this, which is about the fourth leaf back. It's fully formed. So I want to collect a number of these. Most laboratories need about a handful of tissue. The number of leaves per sample will vary according to the size of the, the species that you're sampling. But generally you need a pretty good handful of tissue. 20 leaves, 25, somewhere in there is, is typically a good number. Better to send too much than too little. It is okay after you take your leaf sample if the leaf tissue gets dry. Um, it's not okay if the leaf tissue rots. If the tissue just dries, the nutrient contents won't change. But if the tissue starts to rot and decompose, the nutrient contents will change and the sample really will be worthless at that point. So again, I'm collecting most recent fully matured leaves here. Um, after you've collected about 20 or 25, um, I actually need a little more tissue than I have here, but once I have a good handful of tissue, again, I would collect that leaf tissue and take a bag. This is a paper bag with plastic lining inside. Some leaf tissue, though, can rot in a plastic bag. So, again, you close up the uh, sample. The laboratory drying and grinding process will homogenize the leaf sample, so you don't need to worry about homogenizing the tissue or anything. The laboratory will take care of that, and we then label our, our sample bag with however we want the sample identified, you know, for the laboratory. Fill out sample information sheets for your laboratory. Most laboratories have those available online free of charge, and um, you're ready to go. Lastly, we're going to talk about how to sample irrigation water. If you're sampling from a well in a nursery, let's say, you don't want to collect your sample from an aspirator or a sprinkler head. The reason is the sprinkler head will help throw off carbon dioxide that's in the water and it will change the pH of the water, generally making it higher. You generally want to go from the end of a pipe or from a spigot on the pump itself. It's important to let the water run for a couple of minutes. Otherwise, you might be sampling old water that might have been sitting in that pipe for a while. You want to sample fresh representative water when you're sampling wells. If you're sampling lake water or pond water, don't just walk up to the pond and take a sample from the edge of the pond. I used to believe that because of diffusion, waters within a pond were uniform. I found that's not the case. There's inflow, there's outflow. Your best sampling out of the pump that's pulling water out of the irrigation pond. Again, you can take that from the end of a pipe or from uh, a spigot that might be on the pump. Most pumps have that. Again, you want to let the water run for a couple of minutes. If you have a pressure tank or any kind of water in the lines, you kind of want to move that water out and get fresh water direct from the ponds to collect your sample. You can use pretty much any bottle as long as you rinse it four or five times from the, uh, the water source that you're going to sample. It's better not to use petroleum type stuff, but just a regular old drinking water bottle from the convenience store will be fine. Simply take the cap off and fill it all the way to the top. Don't leave any air space in the top if you can avoid it. Sample it all the way to the top and seal it. Pond water especially, but also well water, has microbial activity going on in it. The, the microbes are respiring and they're sending out waste products, many of which are acidic. And so the microbes in the water, especially in lakes, are going to change the quality of the water a little bit. If you just keep it, you know, empty with the headspace, the pH tends to stay more stable and the microbial activity is not encouraged as much. And then label it as such. You don't normally need to refrigerate water samples. They'll normally stay good for a while. Um, the mineral contents, again, don't change with time. So by the time the laboratory gets it, whatever sodium is in it is in there and it's not going anywhere. And that's basically how you sample soils, plant tissue, and water. One final word, again, the key word in sampling is representative. Be as sure as you can that the samples you're taking are truly representative of the crop in question. And therefore, you get more useful data that you can use to make crop growing decisions. Thank you.